Hello, everyone. My name is Rick Wayman. As CEO of the Foundation for Climate Restoration, it's my privilege to welcome you to the fourth annual Global Climate Restoration Forum. Over the next two days, we'll be looking at many ways in which we are empowering a growing international community of people and organizations dedicated to restoring the climate. I wanna start out by thanking each of you for joining us today. Restoring the climate is a challenge that will require many, many people from around the world with a broad range of backgrounds and skills. It's a thrill to be part of this growing community with you. A big thank you also to all of our panelists, moderators, and workshop facilitators for taking time out of their busy schedules to help guide us all to greater knowledge and engagement on key climate restoration issues. This event would not be possible without the all-star staff of the Foundation for Climate Restoration. Our staff is small, but very mighty, and I cannot express my gratitude sufficiently for their partnership in pursuing our very important mission. Thank you also to our volunteers around the world who are doing inspiring work on the ground every single day to create the conditions necessary to restore the climate. And finally, Thank you to those of you who have invested in the work of the Foundation for Climate Restoration throughout the first five years of our existence. As a nonprofit organization, we rely on the generosity and foresight of donors to make all of our work possible. I particularly wanna recognize the Peter J. and Sharon D. Fikowski Trust as the lead sponsor of our forum. It's an honor to be with you again as we launch this year's program. Last year's forum marked my first week as CEO of the foundation. Now, a year later, I'm so excited to fill you in on the progress that we've made in the last year, both in terms of scaling up our programs and in raising the profile of climate restoration worldwide. Like Rick, I'd like to welcome you all to the fourth annual Climate Restoration Forum. I'm Erica Dodds, the Chief Operating Officer for the Foundation for Climate Restoration, and I've had the privilege of being with the Foundation ever since we started. Uh, I was with the Foundation at our first ever Climate Restoration Forum in September of 2019, where I gathered in New York City with the rest of the F4CR staff, where we held our collective breath as we prepared for this, this first of its kind forum to be held at the United Nations headquarters in the trusteeship council chamber. It's one of those big rooms with the very official looking uh, plaques and the microphones at every seat. And over 600 people had RSVP'd for that event, but we really had no idea whether anyone would actually show up. We had no idea what the speakers would say, whether, whether the speakers would really make the compelling remarks needed to drive home the importance of climate restoration, which at the time was a very novel concept. Fortunately, that forum was a resounding success and it announced F4CR's global launch to a packed room and buzzing energy it paved the way for later conversations with UN member state representatives, US policymakers, youth activists and organizers, climate scientists, and more. Attendees left with a new sense of optimism about the future, that a restored climate really is possible. The following year, we started planning for the second annual Global Climate Restoration Forum, intending for it to take place once again at the United Nations headquarters. But of course, in 2020, everyone's plans went out the window, uh, ours included. And we were forced to move our event online. But fortunately, having a virtual format was really a blessing in disguise. We had our RSVPs increase from 600 in 2019 to over 800 in 2020. Our audience became more global and diverse and our speakers represented a much broader spectrum of fields. Plus we were able to have the recordings of each session available to the public and each of them were viewed hundreds of times after the event concluded. So with a third forum in 2021, we were able to build on the success of that uh, virtual event from 2020. We partnered 
last year with EarthX TV, who produced and distributed the event for their audience of tens of thousands. Like the two preceding years, the quality and caliber of speakers and sessions continued to improve, and attendees commented on how much they learned and how excited they were left and their desire to get involved in climate restoration. So this year, now that we've had three years to establish that climate restoration is here, it's happening, it's progressing, now this year, it's time to join the movement. We're preparing now for the fourth annual Climate Restoration Forum launching right now. And it's clear that the idea of climate restoration isn't brand new or radical anymore. It's really becoming mainstream. And we're hearing folks around the world ask, how can I get involved? We're delighted to see people embracing the goal of a safe and healthy climate. And we're continuing to build pathways and partnerships for anyone to get involved. So this year, we're going to be hearing from climate restoration activists, young and old from all over the world. And we'll be diving pretty deeply into topics like how we measure carbon removal and ensure that projects are having their intended impacts over time and with no one left behind. We're going to hear what F4CR has been developing over the past year and what's in the pipeline coming up. For those of you who are joining us live, here's a quick overview of what the next two days will look like. In your attendee hub, you'll see all of the panels that you registered to attend today, as well as the workshops that you registered to attend tomorrow. Your attendee hub is the place where you want to return to before every session to find the right link. You can also see who else is attending the forum and send direct messages to other individuals, whether they're a close colleague, a long lost friend, or someone you've been wanting to meet for the first time. We've got F4CR team members here live to engage in the chat and answer questions as the program airs today. I encourage you to keep the chat active, but also focused on the issues being discussed in the panels. After today's panel discussions, we'll be hosting an informal online networking event, which you can also access from the attendee hub. I hope to see you there from 5.15 to 6 o'clock p.m. Eastern time today. Tomorrow's workshops will be in an interactive Zoom format. So I encourage you to come ready to engage with the workshop facilitator and other attendees, and if possible, to have your camera on. Please take a look at the session descriptions for tomorrow's workshops. Many of these sessions have some suggested reading or viewing to do prior to the workshop. And if you're watching this recording after the fact, we'll be keeping all of our videos from the fourth annual forum together on a playlist on our YouTube page. If you search Foundation for Climate Restoration on YouTube, you'll always be able to find us there. Before I got engaged with the Foundation for Climate Restoration, I, like many people, had been walking around for years with the storm cloud of eco-anxiety over my head. It was pretty clear to me that we're doomed, and I was pretty clear that the only thing I could do was try to ignore it and live my life, hoping that someone would figure out how to fix our climate. While learning about climate restoration went a long way towards lifting my anxiety, I found that ultimately the only thing that makes it a true meaningful difference is being in action, devoting my resources and energy to the work that will make the difference. So thank you all for being part of the team and working on restoring our climate. People often tell me that this is the most important work in the world. And while my natural inclination is to be humble and brush that off, the truth is I sincerely believe that this is the most important work in the world. So thank you for working on it with us. That's a great point, Erica. You know, the, the work that we're doing at the Foundation for Climate Restoration is groundbreaking. For as long as I've been aware of the climate crisis, the main focus was always on doing less bad or avoiding the worst consequences. I don't think that you would be here today if, if you thought that was good enough. And I'm certainly here today because avoiding the worst is not nearly good enough. My daughter, Lulu, just turned 13. Before I started with F4CR a year ago, she would ask me about climate change, about what the world is going to look like when she's my age. I never used to have an answer for her that was acceptable for me to speak out loud. I was resigned, hopeless, pessimistic, at best hoping that someone somewhere would 
figure something out to solve this. But now because of the Foundation for Climate Restoration and this incredible community that I'm a part of, I have an answer for Lulu. We are restoring the climate. Who is that someone somewhere who's solving the climate crisis? The people gathered for this forum are an integral part of the solution. Our staff, our partners, our volunteers, our supporters who are investing in our programs. Our goal is huge, bringing atmospheric levels of CO2 back to pre-industrial levels of under 300 parts per million by 2050. It's an immensely challenging goal, but we know that it's possible. And we know that this is the future that we actually want. How exciting is that? We're working for the future that we actually want. So the first panel discussion of our forum today focuses on equity and justice in climate restoration. It's no accident that this is the first panel. Earlier this year, we published a white paper on equity as the fourth principle of climate restoration, which added equity as a key criterion by which to analyze climate restoration solutions, in addition to scalability, financeability, and durability. We look at questions of who shapes policy, who benefits from deployment, and who faces potential adverse environmental and social consequences as we approach commercial scale carbon dioxide removal. Addressing these questions is essential in developing and scaling drawdown technologies that not only remove the excess CO2 from the atmosphere, but also remediate the historical harms suffered by socially and economically disadvantaged groups, including Black, Indigenous, and people of color, low-income communities, future generations, people in the global majority, women, queer and trans communities, children, people with disabilities, and other parties that are commonly under or unrepresented. In addition to the equity and justice panel coming up in just a few minutes, Delaney will also be leading a one hour workshop for a deeper dive into these topics tomorrow at 11 o'clock a.m. Eastern time. I hope you'll also join us for the coffee break after that equity panel where we'll be talking about climate education. As we increase the number of people involved in the climate restoration movement, it's clear that we need young people, especially to understand what it means to restore a safe and healthy climate. And that in fact, they can demand a climate that will work for them. In 2020, FRCR launched a digital kids lesson uh, directed at kids aged eight to 12. The program is a self-paced course, and it includes a teacher's guide so that teachers can implement the course in their classrooms. Already, this course has been accessed by users in over 50 countries. And we've heard great things about the impact that it's had on young people who have gone through the curriculum. Right now, we're in the process of designing a high school course on climate restoration in partnership with an organization called Girl Up, which is a UN Foundation initiative committed to empowering girls and advancing their skills and opportunities. The high school course will include content about climate change, the carbon cycle, climate restoration, climate justice, and the actions the participants can take to advance climate restoration. In particular, for every new concept that's introduced, we'll be featuring a story from a young person who is experiencing the impacts or seeing that concept in real life on the ground so that young people can see themselves and see the world around them in these sometimes abstract concepts that are so critical to understanding climate change and climate restoration. At our first annual Global Climate Restoration Forum at the UN headquarters in 2019, a high school student named Ashley Miki attended and had her world turned upside down. She had come into the event certain that she had no future, going through the motions of school and life on autopilot. She came out understanding that this did not have to be the case, and she committed herself to climate restoration. She joined F4CR's board of directors and designed and launched what's now known as our Youth Leaders for Climate Restoration program. Ashley's vision is that empowered young people from around the world put a face to the concept of today's youth and future generations and demand that global leaders work to restore their climate. 
We launched this program at the beginning of 2021 and the applicant pool grew quickly. So far, we've had applicants from over 55 countries and all six inhabited continents. The program has been revised based on feedback from participants, providing greater opportunities for networking, more training to mentor the next cohort, more supplementary materials to expand their understanding of climate restoration, and more opportunities to create content like videos about their personal stories and experiences. Program alumni are connected with the local chapter coordinators, so they have the opportunity to create local chapters in their communities after they've formed this strong foundation of climate restoration expertise. At the end of last year, we awarded the first set of Climate Restoration Innovator Awards to outstanding program graduates in Liberia, Indonesia, and India. Our goal is to grow our alumni group to well over a thousand graduates in the next two years. Your support will allow us to provide more rigorous training, ongoing engagement, and global promotion of this program. Let's hear from Ezekiel Nainfor, one of the young leaders who received our Climate Restoration Innovator Award last year. Ezekiel is an incredibly effective climate restoration advocate in Liberia, and more recently throughout the African continent. Hi everyone, my name is Ezekiel Yanfo, and I'm from Liberia, West Africa, 2021 recipient of the Climate Restoration Innovator Award. This award means so much to me. It is an inspiration for me. It serves as a motivation to do more works in restoring our climate. I want to say a very big thank you to the Foundation for Climate Restoration through the Youth Leaders for Climate Restoration Program for affording me this opportunity to be awarded this prestigious award. The Youth Leaders for Climate Restoration Program is a flagship program of the Foundation for Climate Restoration. And any young person can apply for this program to understand what climate restoration is and how you can get involved with the advocacy for climate restoration. You can apply using the application link that will be shared on our social media platform with the Youth Leaders for Climate Restoration. Thank you very much. It's so inspiring to hear from the young people and the leaders driving this movement forward around the world. As this movement has grown, we've been discovering that the information available about carbon dioxide removal solutions doesn't always make it clear how well a solution is suited to the goal of climate restoration. So in order to enable our leaders around the world to be as powerful as they can, we've made it our mission to develop the resources they need to drive climate restoration forward. In the last year, we started our solution series, which we launched in April. And so far we've covered three different types of climate or carbon dioxide removal solutions. For each one, publishing a white paper, a blog post, an animated explainer video, and hosting an expert panel. For each solution, we break down how it relates to our climate restoration criteria, as Rick mentioned, which are scalability, financeability, durability, and equity. Our vision is that when the series is complete, we will have covered all of the key categories of carbon dioxide removal solutions and will have robust materials that make it clear which solutions are best suited and in which ways for the goal of climate restoration. We'll also be able to summarize based on our extensive research which solutions might be most promising in the present day and which considerations we need to really have in mind as these solutions get implemented and scaled up. We'd like to show a quick video clip of one of the expert panels, which we've found to be so informative and inspiring. Uh, the ship has really sailed in terms of our ability to decide whether or not removing carbon dioxide has to be sort of part of the pathways that we need to pursue in order to maintain a livable climate. So we have to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere in addition to rapid and complete decarbonization and investments and adaptation that must be made in preparation for inevitable climate change that's already underway. So I think when you think about CDR, there's a whole portfolio of options that range from quote unquote nature-based to engineered solutions and they're expanding and multiplying all the time. But what we have to do when we think about carbon dioxide removal, we have to think of what is the problem and then 
judge the solutions we want to prioritize based on efficacy. How good are they at doing that thing while also not imposing other risks uh, that are other negatives uh, that would outweigh the benefits? And I think DAC already in its early nascency is multiplying and evolving in certain ways that it has an enormously high upside and has really, really powerful advantages. So um, the moral hazard question, I understand why it's raised, but in some ways, I think we're past the point where we can really think that way any longer. We have to do multiple things at once, uh, not just one thing over the other. And uh, Mara and Selena, I assume that you uh, agree with Chris on this point. Do you have any other uh, points that you'd like to make on, on that? Yeah, maybe just that like as, as we're working on carbon removal and uh, as we're kind of advancing these solutions, I think we as, as uh, folks in this space need to sort of be also pushing for decarbonization. I think, you know, Chris was, Chris was talking about that. And so I see the work of sort of carbon removal uh, technologists and advocates as kind of doing two things as first sort of recognizing that we are past the point where we can achieve 1.5 or potentially even two degrees without carbon removal and that we'll need a mix of options in order to do so but that also the scale of carbon removal necessary in the low decarbonization pathways for the IPCC has been deemed by, by a number of modelers as, as very difficult to achieve, right? If not potentially impossible. And so we need to do kind of two things. We need to advance this technology and recognize that it is an important part of the mix while also tempering expectations of its ability to kind of erase years of, of lost time on decarbonization. Um, so it's kind of this like, you know, pushing from two sides and trying to figure out like where the middle is going to be. You may have heard us talk about the importance of creating an enabling environment for climate restoration solutions, but what does that look like in practice? One critical piece is having policies in place at all levels of government and around the world that provide critical funding to early stage climate restoration solutions provide market advantages to commercial solutions, and commit governments to the goal of climate restoration. These types of policies don't emerge in a vacuum. It takes a deliberate strategic effort to educate policymakers about these policy opportunities and the outsized impact they can have. That's why last year we launched our local chapter program. This is a large and growing network of powerful, well-informed citizen expert advocates who work with elected officials around the world to create a policy environment that supports the rapid scale-up of climate restoration solutions. So since the beginning of 2021, we've grown from five pilot chapters to 36 chapters worldwide. Currently, we have 15 chapters in the US, 10 in Africa, eight in Europe, one each in Canada, Pakistan, and India. The next regions that we're targeting for chapter development are South America and Asia. We plan to double to at least 70 chapters in the next year. We also plan to expand the membership and actions of these chapters to bring them to their full potential. We've been blown away by the level of interest we've received, particularly as we're asking more of our volunteers under our new chapter structure. Our monthly conference calls, which we started earlier this year, have boasted expert guest speakers like Representative Paul Tonko of New York, who introduced the Federal Carbon Dioxide Removal Leadership Act in the US House of Representatives. Let's see what he had to say about our local chapter volunteers and the importance of the bill that he introduced, as well as the importance of our advocates' work. We can start the process of restoring safe climate while creating hundreds of thousands of U.S. jobs. And finally, I want to express my appreciation for the work that all of you do as advocates for a sustainable climate. Our work in Congress would not be possible without organizations like the Foundation for Climate Restoration and all of its splendid volunteers pushing us all to stay accountable to our constituents, to future generations, and certainly to our planet. Your support means everything to me. So 
Thank you so much for all that you do. I really appreciate your support for this bill. I know you can be a powerful voice to convince other elected officials to not only support pro-climate, pro-clean energy legislation, but also to prioritize it, which is important amongst the many issues that come before us in Congress. We all know the cost of climate inaction is too high. Standing still, st status quo is taking us backward. And CDR can have an important role in our fight to decarbonize. With your help, we can make certain this vital piece of the puzzle is in place when we need it. So I thank you again. Now it's my pleasure to introduce F4CR's newest staff member, our new Chief Development Officer, Maria Finnegan. Maria is a seasoned philanthropy professional with over 12 years of experience building relationships at leading universities and organizations. She began her fundraising career at the Democratic National Committee in Washington, D.C., and then went on to roles at the Massachusetts Institute for Technology and Harvard Law School before returning to her home state of New Hampshire. Most recently, she led individual giving efforts at the Society for the Protection of New Hampshire Forests, the state's oldest and largest land trust, where she worked to help fund forest carbon practices through land conservation. Prior to her work in philanthropy, Maria was a journalist and member of the media. She attended the SI Newhouse School of Public Communications at Syracuse University, and she worked at NPR, NBC, ABC Sports, and ESPN. She's still a storyteller at heart, and she enjoys working with people to help bring change. We're so grateful to have Maria on our team because, as Rick has said, this work cannot happen without the support of people like you. Maria is so great at finding people who are committed to climate restoration and bringing them into our network, and we hope that you all will develop close relationships with her yourself. Hi, my name is Maria Finnegan, and I'm the Chief Development Officer at the Foundation for Climate Restoration. I want to take this opportunity to personally thank you for being a part of this year's forum. I'm excited to be here, and I'm really grateful that you are, too. Whether you've been involved with climate restoration before or if you're a newcomer, just like me. Honestly, up until a couple of months ago, I had never heard of climate restoration. I really thought we were on the right path. You know, uh, my husband has a plug-in car and uh, we weren't using plastic. And I heard that by 2050, we were going to be at zero emissions. So I thought, hey, we're going to be okay, you know? And that's really how I thought for several years. Recently, I've realized that that's not going to be the case. I moved away from my home state of New Hampshire after college and I came back recently. And just in the time that I've been gone, I noticed changes in the weather and they're alarming. And it's really started to worry me, especially when I gave birth to my son. And then I found out about climate restoration. And for once, I felt hope. We have these abilities, but no one knows about it. And why is that? Why did I just learn about this? And I saw in my hometown in New Hampshire as well, you know, everyone was talking about solar. Everyone was talking about wind, but no one was talking about removing carbon from the atmosphere. Someone needs to change the conversation. The great thing about F4CR is our entire goal is to change that conversation. Every year we have the forum and we're able to look back and see how far we've come. And it's incredible. Now, the truth is this kind of work isn't free. It doesn't just come out of thin air. And that's where you come in. If you're able, we would really appreciate if you could donate to us to give any kind of gift that you can to help us continue our work because we do rely on donations from people just like you. And with your help, we can continue making climate restoration a reality. So please, this is the time. It's not tomorrow, it's not the next day because every day that we waste is another day that more carbon is going into the atmosphere and more legacy carbon is doing damage. So please, if you're able, make a donation to the Foundation for Climate Restoration and help us be a part of this work. Thank you. Now that we've hopefully gotten you all excited about what we have coming the next two days, I'm so excited for the next session, which is all about equity in climate restoration. This movement is really for everyone, and it's so critical that we keep equity considerations in mind to ensure that the most vulnerable people who are 
the most uh, who are feeling the impacts of climate change the most are included at the decision making table and are really receiving the most benefits of our climate restoration work. So I hope you'll join us for that panel coming up next. Thank you.